I woke up one morning. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I was getting ready to go to breakfast with some friends. And I was getting my like clothes out of my um, suitcase. And I tried to say I was going to go take a shower. And it came out like, oh, blah, 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 blah. like mm. really, really weird. I don't even know how to like re-imitate it. Shit's about to go down. I'm feeling something in my spirit. Chops and Tats with Aaron Della Vadova. Hello, friends, neighbors, beautiful beings of light filled with creativity and love. It's in there, man. It's still in there for, hey, if you don't feel that way when I say that, I'm, I'm, I challenge you. Sit somewhere quietly in a beautiful place and really ask yourself, because it's still, we're all born with it. Shit happens. We lose track of it. It gets covered up with layers of life and trauma, but it's still there. I see it in you, and I know that you guys are shining pretty brightly. Otherwise, you wouldn't even listen to this goddamn show. So thank you for tuning in once again to Chats and Tats. And as you all know, I love stories of redemption, stories of people overcoming huge obstacles in life. You know, a lot of people, it crushes them. They never are the same. They will use that traumatic event as an excuse for everything they can't accomplish or can't do. Yet you'll meet others that have been through some pretty gnarly shit and they just get up, pull their pants up and get on with life. And the person I have on today is one of those people. She went through what I think a lot of artists would consider like the worst nightmare ever, even though, look, let's be fair. There's probably worse things that can happen to humans. I do. And I think she would agree there is, but you know, I have been terrified of, something like this happening to me, whether it be a motorcycle accident or something else. And I've been lucky enough to still maintain and not have any of those things go down, but she went through something and it really affected her life and it really affected her career. And uh, it's been a few years now and she's back on the horse. So I'll let her kind of break that down for you guys. And then we're going to get into a little bit about just her journey in tattooing. I don't know if I mentioned she is a tattoo artist of 16 years, but I'll let her kind of get into all this stuff with her own words. So with all that being said, please welcome my guest today, Stevie Randolin. Hi. Hi. Thanks welcome. for having me. I'm glad you're here. Thanks for coming. You know, we out front were talking and turns out we have some friends obviously yeah. in tattooing. <laughs> you currently work out of your tattoo studio yeah. in Kingman, Arizona, Blackwater Tattoo. Mm -hmm. You've had for 10 years off and on because you went yeah. through some things that we're going to talk about. I'm yeah. sure it couldn't be open consistently, but it's been off and on for 10 years. You've been tattooing for 16 years, yeah. but you also have a lot of connections in Las Vegas at a few shops with Bad Apple, notably. Yeah. Eddie, good friend of mine. Yes. DJ, good friend of mine. Great people. So that was fun that we recognized that we know some folks in common. Yeah. And you are born here in San Diego. Well, and I wasn't born here, but okay. my parents moved me here. You meet, like, I grew up my whole childhood right here, so this is sort of the, yeah. the original homeland yes then. yeah ocean, ocean beach. beach yeah i fucking love ocean beach i loved it i loved it then oh not so was, much now I, I now it's complicated yeah, it was all hippies and bikers yeah yeah, yeah. i remember my friend <laughs> i was just I, I lived in ocean beach when i first moved to san diego 27 years ago whatever and uh, I was pulling the punk rock look and yeah. I didn't understand, you know, to me it yeah. was like, oh, this is where all the freaks live. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, these like more biker dudes, I had like green hair or some shit. And yeah. Like they drove by me. You're like, get the fuck out of OB, you fucking freak. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is gnarly. I don't like punk rock dudes. It was yeah. just, I don't know, just one little moment. But I did, have, I spent a lot of time in, in Ocean Beach and it's, it's, it's cool to me too. I hate to even say it on air, but. A lot of people who come to San Diego, they don't even know. No, it's it's kind of like a hidden little gem. It is. You have to like know because it's like that one little tiny road going in. Yeah. And like unless you make it in there, you have no and, idea. And then it's attached to what I think is one of the mo most beautiful places in all of San Diego, which is Sunset Cliffs. Yeah, yeah. The place is gorgeous. That was my favorite place to uh, trick or treat when I was a kid because you got every place was a candy bar, like a whole candy oh, bar. Oh, yeah, because it's a bunch of mansions yeah. on, on yeah. that peninsula. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. So we have a lot of kind of common, you know, San Diego, Southern California. I grew up in Boulder City, Nevada, just outside of Las yeah. Vegas. Yeah. So I'm sure we, if we talked long enough, we'd probably find about 50 more people yeah. we both know. We'll figure that out later. But I don't want to put you, I just want to throw you in the deep end, but I do. Yeah. Because one of the reasons I want to have you on is what I said in my introduction, which is overcoming adversity. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us this story? 
and I believe we're talking five years ago or am I yeah, getting this timeline uh, it right? It should be actually uh, April 15th will be my fifth year since the stroke. Oh, almost so, nailed it. Yeah. All so, right. Almost five years. Yeah. What happened? So I was down here coincidentally visiting. I woke up one morning. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning. I was getting ready to go to breakfast with some friends and I was getting my like clothes out of my um, suitcase and I tried to say I was going to go take a shower and it came out like, oh, blah, 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 blah. like mm. really, really weird. I don't even know how to like re-imitate it. But I went to say that and the person that I was seeing back at the, this time, he was like, do you want to try that again? And I panicked and I was like, no, never mind. And that came out normal. And I remember holding like I just held my mouth and I was like, what? What was what the that? Fuck happened. Yeah, and he went to go get coffee. I go to sit on the couch. She probably just needs a cup of coffee. Yeah, and like <laughs> open my suitcase and I'm picking out my clothes and I'm like leaning forward and I'm like, and then all of a sudden I just fell and I was like pinned in between a couch and a bed and you know I, my body was just dead weight and, and I couldn't scream, I couldn't yell, like nothing would work. And I was like, what is what is this? But I wasn't scared. I wasn't. I don't know. I just, I had no idea what was going on. And so a couple minutes later, he walks back in the room and I go, or he asked me what I was doing. He was like, why, what, why, what are you doing? Why are you on the floor? And, and I could whisper and I could still talk later on. I lose the capability of speech, but I whispered and I was like, I, I can't get up. Like, so he comes over, he sits on the other side of me. We sit on the edge of the bed and he goes, uh, let's go to the hospital. And I was like, I don't have insurance. So no. And I was like, just wait, let, let's just wait 30 minutes to see if it comes back. And he was like, half of your body isn't working. So at this point you're working, everything's working again? No, no, my, my arm wasn't working, but I hadn't like. And you still want to give it 30 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just panicked and I, I was yeah. like, hey. It, no judgment. Also, I just, also yeah. because like, you know, when you're, I mean, up until I learned everything that I learned, I was just like, only old people have strokes. So I didn't think yeah. it was a stroke. Like I was right. just, and, and so to be clear, everybody, she blew that one there, but yeah. the, the cat's out of the back. You had had a stroke. Yeah. yeah. And so my boyfriend at the time goes, you don't have a choice. I'm I mean, and just to be clear too, how old are you now? I am, I'll be 34 next week. So you were, you or were 29 years old. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he puts me in the car and we go to the hospital. Luckily it was only 15 minutes away, which is, I had a hemorrhagic stroke. There's a hemorrhagic and ischemic. Hemorrhagic is only a 20% survival rate. Oh, that's the worst one. Yes, it is the worst one. I should not have lived. <laughs> if I would have been there, like, you know, any longer, like later, I probably wouldn't have made it. So good on him for making the executive decision to ignore me. Yeah. So we got to the hospital and everything was still functioning. But that was when I started to panic is when we were in the hospital and then they skipped everybody else in the ER and we're just, you got they to go cut, in first. yeah, they <laughs> took me in first, cut all my clothes off. And that's when I started to panic. And I was just like, okay, this is bad. Mm. And, um, that's like, I was kind of like one of those things where like you, you know, you're there. And so then you panic or your panic kind of like subsides. And I just like relax and was like, okay, well I'm here and they can take care of me now. And so I'm, I don't know how long the first deal was but i probably was you know in and out for like a whole 24 hours mm -hmm. and then er, my family said i would they they thought that i was like a, unconscious for five days but i would wake up in like the middle of the night mm -hmm. and everybody else would be sleeping and i'd be like what's going on like you know and but i couldn't communicate and i couldn't talk like and that didn't go away until like you know a day or two into the hospital then all mm -hmm. of a sudden my speech went and then like i couldn't figure out certain words. But you had been told at this point, you understood you had had a stroke. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But everybody asked me if I panicked or was scared and I wasn't. I was just like, okay, well, this will be a six month of vacation. I'll be fine. It'll right. come back. You didn't understand maybe the severity of the situation yeah. you were in. Yeah. I was just like, no, I'm young and I'll be fine and Ignorance whatever. is bliss. Yeah. So that's what I thought. And I mean, I was pretty ignorant for, you know, still the first six months. Like I was just like, I, it'll be, it'll, it'll come back. It'll come back. It'll come back. And then it wasn't coming back. And I was just like, shit. So, so, and just to clarify, you, you've been a tattoo artist at this point for 10 ish years, maybe a little longer. 
That's your career. That's the yes. love of your life. That's your dream since you were a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. You did your first tattoo when you were 13. Yes. yes. You, you, you made your, you bet your mom if you got a 4.0, she'd let you get tattooed. Yeah. yeah. You told your art teacher, she was like, just draw tat art. That's your assignment. <laughs> she was apprenticed by an art teacher in high school. <laughs> I don't know who you are out there. Write me. I, I want to yeah. high five you. I want to meet you. That's fucking awesome. <laughs> um, so this is your, you know, I'm just framing this up, but this is your dream. Yeah. And you're right-handed. Yeah. And you're like, oh, it'll come back. It'll come back. But I'm sure part of you is like, holy shit. Like, yeah. this, what am I going to do with my yep. life? Yeah. I panicked at first. And uh, I, I have a friend who actually, he lives here in uh, San Diego. And he was just like, oh, no, if I, like, you can, he's like, he's a practice and do something on me because I was here. And I was also, um, I came down for a guest spot. So I had my tattoo stuff with me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was stuck down here for a year and did all my recovery and everything here. And so, you know, once I had gotten, I don't know, I would say it was like nine months, I got impatient and bored and frustrated. And he was just like, eh, screw it. Like, try and do something on my leg. Well, I tried to tattoo him. And he, he'll send me a picture of it every once in a while. And he's like, don't forget where you came from. <laughs> and... It is a absolutely horrible tattoo. So let me get this straight. You're here recovering. You're six months here recovering. You have yeah. a friend who's like, come on, I'll let you. Yeah. So you go lefty on this yes. dude for the first time ever. Yes. Lefty in one hand and I had no idea what I was. Uh, it was, it's horrible and it's supposed to be. So he, he rides motorcycles and he likes to do a lot of really dumb shit. And um, he put a recliner on the back of his motorcycle and he became quite known everywhere for riding around <laughs> on a motorcycle He's with a recliner. In, in yes. SoCal? yes. I, I, You've seen it. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw that dude. <laughs> okay, so that's Cliff. And, uh, Cliff, so, you're awesome. You made my day. <laughs> so uh, that day. I tattooed what was supposed to be a recliner on him, <laughs> but it looks like two hot dogs and a piece of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it's a mess but he he it's on his high like upper thigh and he'll send me pictures of it and it's just like remember where you came from <laughs> and then it probably took me like another two months before i like decided to get really serious with it and then i tried to tattoo my i basically sat down in my bedroom and was just like you know what i'm gonna try to tattoo well, you're myself. Trying to also i'm sure at this time you're trying to draw things with your yeah left yeah right? which i was because i you know, for the longest time, I was like, how am I going to make money? So I was trying to draw drawings and then make prints and T-shirts and just sell that in between. Because I there was a year where I wasn't tattooing, wasn't making any money, and I have kids. And, and I didn't mention this, but you've got two yeah. daughters. Yeah. You're a single mom. Yeah. So that's, you know, adds a little pressure to yeah. the situation. Yeah. It's not like you're like, oh, my husband, he's an executive yeah. at uh, First Nations Bank. I'll yeah. just retire. Yeah. So I panicked and I was just like, okay, well, what am I going to do? So You know, in a weird way, I have to cut in though. Imagine if that would have been the case. You had the husband that worked yeah. at First Nations Bank and you didn't have to ever work again. I, that would have been a curse. That would have fucked you probably. I don't think so because- You wanted a tattoo so Yeah. Bad. No, I love tattooing too yeah. much. And if I couldn't, like that was my biggest thing is I was like, if I couldn't, if I can create art, like I would- You know what I mean though? Like it, it's amazing to me what humans can get done when there's no way out. Yeah. We're, you know, we're all way more capable yeah. than we give ourselves credit for. We just don't like being uncomfortable. Yeah. And so if you don't have to do something and it gets uncomfortable enough, a lot of us, me too, I'm no Navy SEAL of life. Yeah. I've, I probably sat back yeah. on the couch when I could have given it more. But yeah, you were definitely in a situation. I get what yeah. you're saying. Your passion for tattooing is deep yeah. rooted. Yes. And you'd have done it anyway. Yeah. But you had another layer in there of, I actually have to make yeah. an income for my family. Yeah. I went through the poor, like, poor me. Like, you know, I did the kind of depressed, like. Mad at God. Yeah. Mad at God. Are you religious? No, I'm actually not. Um, you couldn't even be mad at God then. Yeah. I was just mad at life. Life. Um, right. Mad at whatever, whatever chose this it's for me. Fair. Yeah. And uh, so I did the whole pity me, poor me, sadness. I'm going to, How long you did know, that last, you think? It, a couple months. It it definitely lasted a couple let me, months. Let me examine that for a minute because I, I, by the way, who wouldn't do that? Yeah. I actually think you need to do that. Yeah. You got to cry about something for a while before you yeah. can begin healing. Yeah. So you, you were doing that. Was there an event or a moment where you just dried your eyes and went, okay, well, this isn't getting me anywhere. Honestly, what it was is the people like Cliff, like my friends, where they were just like, Stevie, uh, fuck around. Like you tattoo mm -hmm. me like... 
And that's like what it took is, so then I got mad, sat down on the floor in my bedroom, decided to take it a little more seriously and was just like, I'm going to try to tattoo myself. So I, I sat crisscross applesauce and tattooed my ankle and was just like, if this comes out decent, maybe I'll just do, you know, I wouldn't say tidy tattoos because I still tattoo traditionally, but mm. I was like, well, maybe I'll just be doing, you know, little tattoos for the rest of my life. And I, I won't do them that often, but, you know, I can make somewhat of an income. And honestly, tattooing isn't even the hardest part. I was just like, how, how am I going to be professional and like hygienic? And how the hell am I going to get a glove on? I was going to ask you, it's how do you stretch? Yeah, that part. A lot of people don't tattoo, don't realize it ain't the hand you're tattooing where the work's happening. Yeah. It's the other hand that's stretching the skin around the tattoo yeah. that's where the work Which happens. even is like, okay, so you could tell the difference between when I tattoo like a shin or when I tattoo, you know, something. A butt cheek yeah. or something. Yeah. And it, and it's just like, wow, our lines are so straight still. Right. For it's the like, stretching that hold is the harder. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, if, if it's that or if I have like the help or somebody does stretch or the person like kind of helps and is like, you know, pulls all their oh, skin tight. Oh, so you tight. enlist the help of your clients sometimes. Yeah, I will. If they know what they're doing and, you know, right. they can not get in the way as well. Right. So you can tell the difference between an area of the body. and But then there's also the fact of like, I don't really ever take on like first time tattooers, like people that can't sit still, can't, you know, anything like that, because you, you have to be able to sit still. You have to not move. Like, I'm really critical with like people being on their phones, people doing what I'm doing right now and talking with their hands, mm -hmm. um, all those things. It's like you have to do none of that. Right. So your your that, clients need, you got to create a teamwork relationship. Yeah. Like I can get this done, but you got to work with me on this. Yeah. So, but it, it really just was my friends and people inspiring me because I, I posted that tattoo on my ankle and everyone was like, me, I'm down. Like, let's go. And it just lit a fire under my ass. And it was just like, okay, I'm done being poor me. I'm going to figure it out. And that was six months into the that after was, post. Uh, it was, so it happened in April. That was in January. So maybe a little, little yeah, longer. Yeah, a little longer. Yeah. And then it took, I don't know, about another six months. And I actually went to Hawaii to visit a friend during the pandemic. And was just, I couldn't stay like in a house anymore. So I went to my best friends and she lived there. And then you know, she's also married to a tattoo artist. And he's like, we're going to the shop. You're doing a tattoo. And I'm like, okay. I went. Isn't the tattoo community rad when it yeah. comes to needing support? Yes. It is, I, it is the, I just love the tattoo community in general. It yeah. is just so inspiring. Nobody ever lets you give up. Like it's, yeah. it's, I don't know. I love it. So I went there, tattooed him and her and I actually, that was, I, I don't use them. I don't like the little like pens. I don't, I don't do cartridges. I don't. Oh, I was going to get into that with you. Yeah. I don't do any of that. That's, it's too complicated for me. Needle bars all the way. That's so funny. You'd say it's too complicated. It's well, simpler. With one hand. Oh. You know what I mean? I have to worry about, I w it would be easier for me to, to prick myself, you know, or accidentally like when I'm trying to get the stupid cartridge off versus uh, like a needle bar exchanging yeah so i can, can i can up. set up the machine laying down right and adjust everything totally like, makes sense yeah and you can have a machine for each needle so you don't got to pop yes. a cartridge out you yes. just grab the other machine so for me i just stick to the old that uh, makes sense yeah i never thought about yeah getting the cartridge that's a two-handed operation yeah so he tried to be like, oh, this is going to be perfect for you. And I was like, nope. And then especially too, like you need that, you need that extra hand for the, ex the extra stretching. Like, yeah. I mean, I, cause like what I do is I place like my hand down and then I pull and then, wow. and then I tattoo and I kind of like pull, I, so I used to pull my lines and now I push lines. You're pulling with the hand, you're pulling the skin tight with the hand you tattoo with and you're dropping the needle on and pushing in yes. the ink. Yes. Right. Okay. So I ended up learning, obviously I was like, these machines are not for me. I can't. It, it felt like the needle was bogging down too much. It was catching. I just couldn't do it. So those first two tattoos were horrible. They were absolutely blown out and just not good. So, but you know, all of that in, set all kinds of inspiration more. And then I came home and Ed uh, Bad Apple was just like, nah, you're coming back. And he was like, mm. So then I started doing a couple of weekends where I would just come to the shop and I would do tattoos and I, I did live out there for a while and I worked there full time. So I had clientele out there and I started doing, you know, small pieces on everybody. And after that, I was just like, okay, it's back. So, but it took me, I think eight months to solve the, cause the hardest parts for me, it was the glove. Mm -hmm. It took me eight months in between like those two 
like the me tattooing myself and then going and tattooing some friends. It took me eight months in between to figure out how I was going to be in a shop and like I could be hygienic and actually be allowed to tattoo because I went through like, okay, well, what do I do? I don't want to have an apprentice. Like, but also like, what do I do? Do I hire someone just to put my glove on and take it off in between every tattoo? And then like, how do you decide what to pay that person? And I just went through a million different things and somebody ended up sending me a tattooer that I wasn't following already. He goes by Southpaw Tattoos and he had been in a car accident and his right arm got severed off mm. and he was a right-handed tattoo artist as well. And so he had to t- to learn how to tattoo with his other hand and tattoo with one hand. And so when he had quite a few followers, so I was like, I, I messaged him and was like either gonna hear back or you know whatever and but i'll try and so i did try and obviously it took i think probably two months for a response but i finally got a response and he was like of course i'll help you and i was like how are you getting gloves gloves on like do you do is somebody putting them on for you you know this that and the other and he was like there is this like 360 rotating hook at, at home depot or lowe's or wherever and he was like I just slip the glove on that and it rotates. So it's like one, I, I flip it one way and I slide my hand in. And then when I'm done tattooing, I flip it the other way and I pull the glove off okay. and it just, it flips it inside out and bug and then I grab it and throw it away. Like no problem. Wow. So I ended up learning that from him. And once I learned that from him, I did eight tattoos in one day and I was just like, I'm back. We're here. <laughs> so that's awesome. I was, I was the whole time like, how's she going to solve this glove thing? Oh, I, I was thinking you asked a client to put it on for you. I did. Okay. So I did that for a, a couple of, a couple of tries, but then I was like, well, once it's like somebody like complete stranger. And then like, yeah. I got to the point to where like I started doing walk-ins again and I was like, I want to ask the ra- right. random walk-in like, Hey, you want to put my glove on yeah. for me? <laughs> and then I went through like, you know, those, I don't know if you know what it looks like, but it's like meant for older people who end up like having an issue to like get a sock on and you put the sock on this like device. Okay. But it's really big. And I tried to use one of those and it would just rip the gloves because it was too wide because it's meant for a foot. And I just like tried all these different things and it mm-hmm. didn't work. And then so then I ended up getting that 360 hook finally. And, and then I wrap like a little bit of cohesive bandage on the edge of it just so that it doesn't ever tear through the gloves. Mm-hmm. Doesn't yeah, rip but, the glove. I tried a lot of different things and none of them worked. Funny, because as I'm thinking about your whole challenges you had ahead of you, didn't even think about the biggest one would be the getting yeah. your glove on. Right? Yeah. 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 But that makes sense. The more I think yeah. about and it. Yeah. And like when I set up, so saran wrap for me is the devil. The absolute, uh, I mean, it's already it's hard the devil. to handle with two hands. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't use saran wrap anymore. Now I, you know, I set up my whole station with, I use a dental bibs. I tape everything down instead. I have like one of those like old school, like really weighted tape dispensers. Uh-huh. And so then I just pull all my tape out off of the, one of those with my station and I use a mayo tray and I have that hook and I use bottle bags. I don't use, so I just don't use saran, like I just have new ways of figuring everything out. And now that I have like my ways of how I do it, I just stick with that. So has anybody ever reached out to you since this has happened to you that are in the same situation asking for help from you? Yes. A More lot. than one? A, a lot. lot. So what was crazy, honestly, well, because, you know, Mike Fight ended up passing. Oh, Mike Pike? Yes. No, not. My memory is not the best ever since my stroke. My memory isn't working so great either. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he ended up passing away and it was because of a, a stroke. And I didn't even know that. Another tattooer ended up telling me it. And it happened like right about the same exact time. So a lot of people had reached out to me because of that. And then... I had quite a few tattooers that had actually had strokes that had had them already. And then they reached out to me. Um, And then I had other people that had had them after. And then people obviously share my story, share my page, Mm -hmm. tell me to reach out to them, which I I will and I do. And then, you know, everybody that has, I I don't know if all of them are, are back to tattooing or, you know, have figured it out or anything like that. But I have tried to be like, okay, well, this is what I did. This is what I do. You know, this is how I set up, you know, A, B, C, D. Mm-hmm. This is how I stretch. And I try to post as many. I don't post enough of them because it's also really difficult for me to make videos and do things of myself as well as, 
you know, the work, but I have tried to do a couple videos to show like my setup, the, what I, what I do. You know what you should do? Mm -hmm. I'm getting some tomorrow. Okay. So I just had a client in here. He's an executive at Facebook and his project that he's one of the head, you know, commanders of. Yeah. <laughs> I use the word commander because I think <laughs> Facebook's a military organization. <laughs> if he's listening, he knows I'm joking him. Nicest guy ever. Yeah. But he he was developing those new glasses. The I don't know if you've seen these. Oh, the, the ones that you can like wear yeah. and then they videotape. I actually got to try some on because I had a girlfriend buy some recently. You got to get those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just say, I think you say meta is the command. So you yeah. could say meta film. Yeah. You could be tattooing while you say it. And yeah. now you're just filming. Yeah. Or meta, take a picture and yeah. boom, and it goes straight into your phone. Yeah. She just showed them to me and then she was showing, like she, her kid put them on and they were like doing something and she showed me the quality of the video and I was like, are you serious? Oh, like, they're sick. Yeah. I don't think I would get them if I wasn't a tattooer. I can't wait to have those on my face yeah. and then be able to just like, you know, when you're tattooing and you're like, this is a really cool, sp yeah. like, this looks cool right now. Yeah. Yeah. Just tell it to go. Yeah. And now I've got a clip of that. Yeah. Without degloving, getting my phone. I won't, yeah. I won't do all that oh, shit. Oh, and I wear glasses anyway. So it's have, like, they, yeah. They're almost like ray they're on my face, yeah. 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 You got to get those. Yeah. They're not that bad. They're like uh, 300 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, well, because I asked her, I was like, well, well, how much are these? And she's like, 300 bucks. And I was like, well, that's Plus what your glasses, prescription. That's what glasses cost anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm getting some tomorrow. Yeah. I can't wait to get these things. Have you ever done any speaking uh, at places where people have gone through stroke who aren't tattooers, but just to be an inspiration to them? Like, hey, I know you're struggling right now. You're worried about how to eat food and how to do basic household things. Look what I was able to accomplish. I haven't done any like crazy, like, like in front of a lot of people. Everybody with strokes, it kind of like affects people differently where, you know, some people it takes their speech away. Some people it takes their vision away. Some people it takes their mobility like myself. Some people, it kind of gives an all across the board and hits everything. Like there's some people that they can't do any of those things. And so. There's some people um, that wake up in an enlightened state of mind. Yeah. You've so, seen those examples? I haven't seen any. Dude, but, there's a TED yeah. talk. I'm going to screw this up. But there is a <laughs> neuro scientist, I think. She had a stroke. And it goes through how when she recovered, she was like. Like she's like yeah. the Buddha now. Yeah. And so I had read her story. Oh, you have heard of that yeah. one. Yeah, I, I had. Not about the part with her being a Buddha, but like, you know, type person now. But Well, her brain now, like when they do brain scans of somebody in deep meditation, the beta waves are at a certain place and stuff. Uh -huh. they, they scan her brain now. She's, her brain operates in that. Yeah. Like, like if we were in deep meditation, that's wow. how her brain is all day. Okay. So she, you know, of course, yeah. says the greatest thing ever happened to her, kind of thing. Yeah. But then again, she didn't lose the ability to walk and speak and things like that. Yeah, but all that. She almost basically got a gift out of the yeah. thing. But well, that was my whole thing. Is I realized so. This is just my personal story and input, but because my like artistic side wasn't affected. Your the, ability to be creative. Yeah. So the way that I was explaining everything, like in the hospital afterwards, everything like that, is I would, it would be like Pictionary. So I couldn't remember things and I couldn't remember certain words. Like when I woke up, they told me, what year is it? And I was like, it's 1969. I'm not even born yet. You know what I mean? Right. So I'm, I don't know where, where I got that. I have no idea. Then they, they used... Well, you kind of dress and look like you're from 1969. <laughs> and then they used... I didn't mean that you look old. It's just, you're riding <laughs> yeah. old choppers. Yeah. You got traditional tattoos. Yeah. I think that's just your year, man. Yeah. That's your like, soul year. Take me back then. <laughs> yes, I would love that. And then uh, they showed me flashcards and they were like, okay, you ha if you can't tell us what these are, then you fail. And the flashcards that they showed me was a hammock and a cactus. And I was like, I got this. And I looked at the cactus and I was like, I'm from there. I live there. And they were like, what is it? And I was like, fuck you. Like, I was so pissed. Like, I, the only words that that were like super stuck were curse words. And so I just got so frustrated and was so mad that I failed and everything like that. And so afterwards, after after all of this had happened, I couldn't remember certain words. And it was like my brain was just kind of like, so when I finally got to eat it was like five days in and they had done like a food test on me to make sure that like this head from my mouth was working and that i could swallow and you know i wasn't gonna choke to death so when i could finally have food i was like i wanted a grilled cheese because i love grilled cheeses and my mom knows that and i hate hospital food so i was like i need to like i need to go to the cafeteria but i couldn't stop saying orange juice so i don't know if i was just like cheese orange Right. You know, and it was going through all these things, but I kept 
messing it up and saying all these other words than what I was trying to get. So I started playing Pictionary, which I ended up learning later on. I watched a meme or saw a meme and it was, it said people that have like, you know, strokes. It was a picture of a hummingbird and it was like that, oh, that flying vibrating midget, midget bird. And I was like, you know, what do you think of when you, when you hear that? Oh, it's a hummingbird. Mm. And so... You could hear the description of something, you could connect it to the word. Yeah, and I, if I could view it and I could do pictures, then I could, you know, so that's how it was. And so I remember I like one time I was super frustrated with my mom and I was like, Mom, what is the thing that you put the food in? Like, you put the food, you keep the food, like you have a million of them in your house. What is it? And she was like, you know, my mom was just like, I don't know. My brother's like, you mean Tupperware? And I was like, yes. And so I would always play Pictionary with people and I'd be like, I would explain, like, this is what it is, is what it looks like, this color, everything like that. And I was like, I need you to guess what it is so that I can remember what the word is. Mm. And then what? And then once I have that, I can remember the word. That one's done. Yeah. On to the that next That one's word. done. Just like how cactus is like, now I just have this memory of, like, that f- stupid flashcard is where it live and everything like that. I have that memory and I hold that and use that to remember it. So it was just like that That's with everything. Interesting. Yeah. Did you notice any um, changes in just your personality or your views? Yes. Yeah, I want to hear a bit about that. Uh, like you like different things now. You see philosophically you, things different. So I can go two ways with that. One has made me very kind of re- reminds me of like, you know, how you're know, like, man, I wonder what made this old person turn into the senile snappy person. Well, having as you, you age, you know, your brain kind of deteriorates when as you get older. Well, I feel like when I had my stroke that it it jumped me up to that because mm-hmm. it was just like my patience was just mm. mm-hmm. and I would be a, a lot more snappy, a lot more emotional, a lot more just I can't do this. No, I have no negative patience. Yeah. General. Well, I wouldn't say it was negative. It's just like, you know how old people are like, I'm not dealing with traffic. Right. No. Right. No. And it's just like... To- tolerance is yeah. down. Yes. It's absolutely zero. Patience is low. So it jumped me to that. Like immediately and then for the first 10 months i lost my everything tasted like pancake batter Mm. everything (laughs) steak fruit (laughs) cheese everything i hated food didn't want to eat it everything tasted disgusting it had changed everything entirely and i was a very i mean i still kind of am picky but i was a very very picky person before And I would like to think that my stroke kind of like, I started thinking like other things smelt good all of a sudden or like, you know, I would, something that I wouldn't eat, I'd be like, I want to try that. You know, it changed like those kinds of things. And I was like, this is crazy. This has to be because of my stroke. Mm. So, and then I had these crazy headaches after I had my second kid. So she's 11 had the time ago, this is five years ago. So I'd had them for quite a few years, like seven, seven years. And I had the headache so much that it was three quarters of every month where I, oh. it would, it would, I would be tattooing. And then all of a sudden I'd start to get dizzy and I wouldn't be able to see straight. And I'd be like, I don't feel good. And I'd run to the bathroom and then I'd throw up. And then I'd be like, like, I'd have to get to the, the lines done and be like, I'm so sorry, but we're going to have to split this up into sessions. And like, it was killing me. And I was like, I don't know. I, I tried I went to the doctor. I got my thyroid tested. I got tested for diabetes. They did everything but test me for my brain. And then after I had the stroke, they stopped happening. And then it turns out, so I talked. I ended up talking to the the doctor because I had a like an aneurysm. And they were like, "Oh, you can have symptoms of an aneurysm for years before it actually explodes." Because my I had a blood vessel blow in my head, and my brain, my blood leaked outside of my brain. And then whatever it touches, it kills forever, which is why my arm doesn't work. Because like the mobility section is like right here in your brain. And that's where my stroke was. And so I am brain farting right now. That's all right. You were <laughs> just, you were, you know, really explaining how you had to re, you, you had symptoms basically of your yeah. stroke years prior, but then yeah. after your stroke. And then the, yeah, the headaches. Okay. When I went in and I was talking to him, I was like, could this be symptoms of it? Was this like what, what, what it was the entire time? And he was like, well, there's no way for us to know because we weren't able to test your headache right before the stroke. They were like, but if the headaches are completely gone, because I I haven't had one since. And I mean, it was to the point to where like I I called them my episodes to Mm -hmm. my kids because like I couldn't I had to be in a solid black room. I tried my migraine medicine. I tried 
everything. I tried, you know, I tried changing my diet, exercising, like I tried um, like meal prepping and like, you know, because tattooers are terrible about, you know, we have, we eat once a day, like right, tattooers right. are terrible about that. So then I tried making sure I was eating breakfast and then lunch and then dinner and nothing was changing the headache issue. And then after I had the stroke, all of it went away. I mean, you'll never know, but I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah. I think I've tried yeah. to bet that's. I would do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So there's a gift. Yeah. I mean, you have to deal with what happened, but a life of those headaches yeah. would have been probably worse. And it, considering it, it made me throw up in the middle of like work and like just completely was destroying like me ha having a normal work schedule. That's one thing that I'm just like, I'll, I could never think that more. Interesting. So did, did you feel like your personality changed? With the snappiness, yes. Are you still snappy? I can be. It's not, it's, it's gone down. It's gotten like, as I get years into it, like I've gotten better at react, like instant reaction. It, I, so in the hospital, I told the doctors, I was like, what it is, is so if you had a boiling pot of water on when it boils over, I was like, that's how I feel right now. And I was like, and I need you to leave me alone, like turn the fire off and walk away. Don't try to talk to me. I need a moment. And I was like, that's what having a stroke and, and th this feels like. And they were like, wow, we've never heard explanations like that. And I was like, I'm assuming it's because of like my artistic side. And I'm trying to explain to you via pictures. Mm -hmm. And they said that nobody's tried to explain it like that before. So, mm -hmm. but I have gotten more control of it. But there is like, if I get like really, really upset and I get to the point of crying, I kind of like lose the ability of speech. Mm -hmm. And I have to just be like, okay, I need a moment, like, I, I need to calm down. And, um, you know, and I will get frustrated with myself because, you know, that's not how I was or like, and I couldn't, I can't control it. And I, I can't do anything about it. But all I can do is just like, okay, I'm just gonna, everybody be, leave me alone for a moment. So yeah. well, in a way you can control it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's happening. Yeah. But you have, a, you have the ability to decide what to do about it. Yeah. And you're getting better at deciding. Yeah. That's a skill uh, anyone could probably <laughs> use, right? Yeah, and just because yeah. you're having an emotion doesn't mean you have to react to that emotion. Yeah. You can just stand back and look at it and decide what to do with it. Yeah. Is me cussing out someone right now helping me, <laughs> helping them, helping the situation? Yeah. Usually, no. Yeah. You know, so why did I just do that? That's, yeah, we could all use more of that. And yeah. you've probably really heightened your, your ability to do that. Yeah. You have to. Yeah, you can't be popping off on people. <laughs> yeah, mm. although I will say, like, thank goodness I have the career that I do because I'm just like I don't even like I'll say that I always tell everybody this because I actually I tattooed in um, L.A. and I actually tattooed a mother and a daughter and strokes run in their family and they came and got tattooed by me specifically for the her stroke and the grant. Well, actually. All of them had had strokes, but the grandmother can't talk anymore. And then the mother got most of her stuff back. And so they're sharing all their stories with me. And they're like, yeah, the only words that she can say uh, are curse words. And I was like, that's funny because when I went to, um, so I went to a uh, stroke, like you go there to work out, but it's just stroke, stroke people here in La Mesa. And uh, when I went there, you know, while we're working out, like there, the, there are some of the people are like working out and the only words that they could say are curse words. And I'm like, and my family would always get mad at me and be like, see me, you're just being, you know, and I'm like, I'm not doing it on purpose. Like I, I, I can't remember the words that I'm trying to go for. So the only ones that are going are just the ones that are like super ingrained. Right. So then I would, I would curse. And so, you know, I, I, when I was trying to figure out everything before tattooing worked out, I like looked at my mom and I was like, I am never going to get hired anywhere because my mouth. Mm. And I was like, but also I've been a tattooer for this long. I, I haven't had to like watch myself or like worry about mm. like that was t talking about certain things or. Yeah, if you were you know. a manager of Nordstrom's, it'd be a little yeah. more problematic. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just like, ah, like, thank goodness my job is what it is. So. Yeah. My, my grandfather on my mother's side had a stroke he okay. lost his most of his ability to talk and okay. i remember as a little boy he would just repeat the word shit yeah and now i i didn't know you were helping me to understand that i i now i see it differently like i <laughs> thought he was 
pissed off maybe. No, he's just trying to get words out. He's he trying to say, out. I like mm-hmm. the oatmeal today. Yeah. And instead it's shit, 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 shit. Yeah. Or he's trying to get that word out. And because he can't get that word out, he's like, shit, shit, shit. Like yeah. he's yeah. frustrated with himself. That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. What? Well, I would assume your answer to this is going to be yes, but I don't know. I feel like we all suffer from a disease as human beings of lack of gratitude. It's, yeah. you know, they, you look around every day and you can just immediately see a thousand things that are going right. Yeah. The littlest shit. There's oxygen to breathe. You know, you just take that mm-hmm. for granted. Your feet work, all this stuff, you know. So here you are walking through a reality where most things are going right, but then, of course, we find the little couple things that yeah. isn't going right. So what I'm building towards is this lack of gratitude for the beautiful ability to be alive, you know. Yeah. I would assume you're, you've got a lot more of that. Yeah. I have so much gratitude because there is a lot of people like I've, I've, I've gone to that rehab center a lot and there were people like mothers and fathers outside in the parking lot. And they were like, how did you figure it out? How did you get it back? Like, how do I t- give this back to my kid? Because there were, there were other kids like young that mm. were even younger than me that in their entire life was, you know, altered and going to change forever. And I was like, well, this is what I did. I was like, and hopefully like you can, you know, work through these and these steps and hopefully it works. And, but I can't guarantee any of it because every stroke's different. But that was one thing that I was just so thankful for. And I had all the gratitude in the world is because I was able to work mine out. So do you feel like you experience more joy in your life after the event than before? Um, yes and no. Like there's, there is a lot more that I have appreciation for, but then there, there's times where like, you know, my kids play softball and now I can't catch a ball with my kid. Mm. Like, so there's, 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 there's times where I'm like super thankful. And then there's times where I'm like, I hate this. Mm. So Mm. a little bit of both. Yeah. Mm. And you, you mentioned earlier too, before the show started your, some of the things you did to, to help with your recovery, equestrian therapy, uh, hyperbolic chamber yeah. therapy, um, acupuncture, uh-huh. I'm missing a couple. But I found it yeah. interesting, and I'll let you talk about all of them. And I'll, you tell us, because it yeah. was interesting what helped you the most. Go ahead. I don't know specifically. I, I, the acupuncture is probably the one that I know for sure was the most because it gave me most of my like facial movements back. I dueled on myself like crazy. I couldn't drink anything unless it was through a straw because everything would just fall out of my mouth because I couldn't close my mouth. I'm not super into like lip injections or all of that kind of stuff, but I did get lip injections because of um, all my drinks kept falling out of my mouth and I was frustrated. So then I did all my research on the internet. Do people ever do this or get this or have this after a stroke and does it help? And, you know, A, B, C, D and there was like a couple, I couldn't find a lot, but there was a couple of people on the internet that were like, okay, yes, I, I've done it and it did help. And so I did it and, and it did help. And I would say the acupuncture was the most help because, you know, my face drooped my, like you, if, if somebody took a picture of me with a flash, like one eye would be like, and the other one would close. Um, it's like my muscle structure was just gone on mm-hmm. this side of my face. But so I would say that helps the most, but the hyperbolic oxygen chamber therapy, you know, because like people do like welding and, you know, scuba diving and bubbles go to their head and, you know, stuff with your brain and stuff like that. That's how they recover from it is in one of those. And so, you know, I had this theory that that was going to help me. I don't know if it did. I, I think I did about 40 sessions um, in total. I'd like to think that it's just like a collectively all of it just a little bit of everything yeah and then the the equestrian therapy you know i had to figure out how to get on a horse and like so if i was standing up i could show you but my leg i can't lift this leg like very well and i can't swing it like over and i can't run i can't do any of those kinds of things but doing those things i had to like you know force my muscles to do things again. And so by like having to hike this leg over the horse, you know, I built just a little bit of muscle to where I could like start to kind of get something back. And then, so I I did that and then I did CrossFit and I was building my muscles that way. And then I had the physical therapy and the occupational therapy that I was doing through the hospital. And then I got enrolled in like a stroke 
gym here in La Mesa. And so I was doing like double time of both of them. So I was doing one with the hospital and I was doing one on my own. And I just think that there, it was a, a group effort with all of it. So. But distinctively that yeah. uh, the acupuncture. acupuncture. Yeah. Hmm. I would say more than anything, Eastern medicine is, mm -hmm. Western medicine has not done shit for my stroke. No. Western medicine is good for acute trauma, right? Yeah. But yeah. for long-term healing. Yeah. You know, my wife and I own together a, a, a health spa. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of alternative therapies there. Yeah. And yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. That's cool. And then, uh, well, I wanted to ask you about your journey in tattooing as a female and the challenges it presented. I, I have a feeling you're going to be like, no big deal, <laughs> because you've got this other huge challenge in your career. Is is that something to talk about or yeah, not? Yeah, no, it honestly is. Um, so my... I mean, when I got in, almost 100% men. Yes, it and was... And if you were a female tattooer, it was like a unicorn. It was, and it was still, it was still like a very... Um, like a lot of the the girls that did get in, it was like you had to be worried that, you know, other male tattooers were just trying to use you for sex mm -hmm. or, you know, you had to, you were taken advantage of. And I am very fortunate that I've never had to go down that road or was ever taken advantage of like that in my career. But, you know, those were all a concern. And then at the time, like, because I think I was only maybe a two two and a half years into my career when I had my first baby. And I was just like, what am I going to do? Like now I have a kid and I'm trying to be a tattooer and mm -hmm. this schedule just does not line up. And my kid's father at the time, or well, he still is, but we're not together. He is also a tattooer. So I was just like, mm. if you get to do this, I get to do this. Like right. this is not fair. And so I think I did six months at home and I was like, Either you figure out how I get to go back to tattooing or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and He's still alive, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. <laughs> so what we did, and we both worked in the same shop, is uh, I, I took my baby to the tattoo shop, you know, and it, for, for me, like, uh, I tattooed up until the day before I had my child. And because obviously we don't have paid time off. And when I finally, I, th I think I was home for eight weeks. And I was like, I can't do this. I, I need to go back to work. So I took the kid with me to the tattoo shop. We had a back like space where I, I could be with her. Like, and if I was working and like, we just kind of like took shifts in between mm -hmm. tattooing and like checking on her. But then also like my booth, like it, I could put the car seat like under where the booth was. And at the time, like this is when everything worked, worked normally, right. but I would rock the car seat. With one foot. With one foot and tattoo. And yeah. Yeah. that's how I figured it out. That's and like people, that would have been a great video. Pe people yeah. would sit and watch and they'd be like, how are you doing this? Like Rocking like, your baby, <laughs> ripping lines. Yeah, because people, I, I'll have women write me all the time and be like, I'm about to have a baby. How did you do it? How are you tattooing? How do you still like have this life? And I'm like, my kids have just, my kids have eat, slept and breathed tattoo shops, like to the mm. point to where they hate. Go, they're like, I have to go to the tattoo shop. This sucks. <laughs> because both m me and their father, we own tattoo shops and they both live in them basically 24 right, seven with right. us. So they're, they're more than, they know way too much their whole entire lives because of it. But you know, I, I'm the one that had to figure it out because I'm, I'm the girl, I'm the mother. And yeah, the challenges you women go under. Yeah, yeah. With all of it. I, my heart goes out to you. Yeah. It, it took me years to realize how privileged I was. Yeah. Like, I thought I was just uh, so good at everything. I'm like, well, I'm also <laughs> didn't have to have babies. I didn't yeah. have to do this. I didn't have to worry about some male tattooer shoving me into a corner of a room and trying to grab my boob. You know, none yeah. of that was in, you know, it's not even on my mind. You yeah. Know? But I mean, obviously the tattoo industry I, I mean gosh i think half my shop is female at this point i love it i love having yeah. women around they bring a whole different energy to the table obviously they're just as creative as the men and they bring yeah. a different style to tattooing and mm -hmm. i'm just stoked to see so many women in tattooing now i think it's awesome yeah well that, that's that's cool and you know another thing i noticed on your instagram did a little little peeping on your instagram <laughs> i think you ride around on a harley i used to I, oh i wish or or, or okay you're probably talking about me being on the back 
I never I, saw you on. I just saw the pictures. I'm like, I, oh, this girl rides. She's I on. do. I, I used to ride my own. And that part is very depressing because I can't figure that out. I wish I could. I would do anything to be able to ride again. You mean before yeah, the stroke? Because before the stroke, I, I rode my, my own. I said, well, back to Cliff. Two months after I got out of the hospital, he still had it, it's not the recliner isn't on the bike anymore. <laughs> He didn't make it that long. It's been too long. But that was the first motorcycle that I got on because there's a recliner. It doesn't you don't have to try it to stay on. It's, right. It holds you in. Right. So that was the first motorcycle ride that I went on afterwards. And then most of like my friends would always be like, do you want to get on? Like, you know. And so I inched my way back into it. And um, my boyfriend now also rides motorcycles. So that is the motorcycle that you're seeing me on the back of. Okay. So. All right. Yeah, I was gonna. I was kind of leaning up to if you were riding, how you were doing it, because you got the clutch and you got to shift your gears and yeah, your braking uh, and all that. It, to be completely honest, if I ever end up rich, like to where I have tons of money to blow, I will, because it. it I can't guarantee that I'll end up being able to ride. So it I would need money to just be like, this is a possibility. Right. But if I ever have a Wrap ton of money. I definitely have talked about it with a lot of friends and a lot of people who build that like I would take, you know, my throttle out of like my right hand and like like shift everything around right. and make pretty much everything like solidly on all movement for uh, this side so that I can left. ride again. Or, you know, I always said I wouldn't ride a trike, but I probably would now because right. now I just am like I miss it, so I yeah. probably would if uh, I, I, I think that's that going to happen well. for you. Yeah, I don't think you need tons of money for that. <laughs> well, I just need a lot of money to possibly blow for, like you know, an experiment. Right, is what it is. Right, it's not a guarantee. Like, okay, well, whatever, because nobody, be nobody, nobody's on... ever going to be like, oh, I need to buy that bike because <laughs> you have I'll... to relearn how to do everything. I mean, haven't all over you found again. people riding motorcycles that have done this already? No, uh, I well, I've I've I met a I met a man who he only had one limb left and he was still riding a motorcycle and I'm just like, what in the call that what? dude? Up. Yeah, yeah, he, so, I mean, one limb. That's even more. Yeah, yeah, but everything works like you know every I, this side of my body doesn't work well. Mm. Like when it. For balance, tenses, even. yeah. When it tenses up, or if I get like scared, everything like kind of like pulls in and like panics. Mm -hmm. So I have like a little bit more stress versus like if everything was just like kind of like dead and limp, I wouldn't be as worried. Mm. Interesting. So. Well, I'm going to put that in my brain vision board for you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about tattooing. So you're you're obviously a big you tattoo traditional tattoos yeah. i can tell that's the that's that's your passion that's yeah. your love so you're you know you're kind of old school in that way what, yeah. what what gives you your 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 passion for the traditional aesthetic well for me when i got into it um it was like when i was a you know teenager and i was going to a lot of shows like punk rock hardcore shows and everything like that and i saw people like that and mostly they're all covered in traditional tattoos and i was just like they're they look, I, that's what I want to look like. Mm -hmm. I love them. And that's like where everything was inspired by, I would say is in the music scene, mm -hmm. um, growing up. And that was just the style. And, and I remember the first couple of times I drew it, I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. I was just, I couldn't figure out black shading and traditional mm -hmm. because I had been artistic and drawn my entire life, but I had drawn like a lot more realism stuff. And so I just was not like trying to make myself simplify. I was mm -hmm. like, I don't get it. Yeah, <laughs> and so that obviously took a while, but yeah, that's it. Would it would definitely I would say it was, is the music scene that really brought it super prominently into my life. You have a love for the traditional aesthetic of tattooing. I'm assuming you probably are a type of person that has a love for the history of tattooing. Yes. It usually goes hand in hand. Yes, yeah. So what do you think about <laughs> what do you think about um, people going in under anesthesia? No, anesthesia I just think is ridiculous. I mean, who has that kind of money? A lot of people do, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine just being like, oh, it, or trusting. Like, I just, uh, I don't know. It just takes everything out of the, like, for me, like, I mean, there's times where I've gotten tattooed, like, just because, like, you know, oh, like, I usually for me as a tattooer, it's like, oh, I want to collect a piece from another tattooer or whatever. But a lot of times 
I'll do it when it is like something serious is happening in my life. And, you know, for me, I've noticed that I'll choose to get tattooed to like kind of like work through that pain. Mm -hmm. And type of therapy. Yeah. And, you know, it kind of just takes away from whatever that whatever's going on in your life. Like you're so busy concentrating on like that. Like, mm. and right there and the pain and everything like that, that like, it takes away from all of the chaos of everything else going on inside your life mm. for me personally. So I think that people need to experience all those things. It's kind of like numbing cream as well. I'm super supportive in it because I'm only tattooing with one hand. So now I will let people, you know, back in the day, I wasn't as supportive, but now I'm like, well, if it makes you sit better and you sit, you know, don't wiggle around yeah, on me. and I can tattoo easier than fine but i also will tell people i'm like you'll never use if, if you if you're not tattooed at all i will never let you use it on a tattoo for your first tattoo because if you don't know what to expect and you have no idea what the tattoo feels like like how are you gonna react how are you gonna heal like everything like that you need to go through all the steps of a normal process one before you can do it, any right. of those but so i'm i think the anesthesia is ridiculous but that, uh, that and i don't think that and i don't think like one time i got tattooed i was working in pismo for a couple years out there and i was getting ready to move back to arizona and i wanted to get tattooed by everybody that i worked with out there and i got tattooed like six times in a span of two weeks and my body was just like healing everywhere and my body like freaked out and i healed every tattoo crap like it was just awful and so because of that too i feel like people shouldn't like over mm. do traumatize too much of the body yeah. in one session yeah it is interesting when you see these i think i saw one the other day under anesthesia full back piece two or three people tagging in and out of it yeah you wake up yeah and you've got half your body is is yeah. been traumatized yeah by it's it. like hammering me basically like i mean, I, I mean i've watched a dj because dj does it all the time he'll do a back piece in two days Jesus. and i'm just like what With like like numbing cream usage i, I don't think he used i uh, i mean i've never really i've never really super paid attention either though i know he's not using it but i don't know if maybe if some because sometimes you know you have that client that puts it on and then wipes it off before right you know so maybe they've done it but i think that they all sit for the most part but because people will fly in and get tattooed by him and they're like I got to do this sleeve. I got to do this back piece in two days because they live across the country or whatever mm. it is. But, Gnarly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what do you say directly to people that are doing it? I mean, I don't know anybody specifically that's that's doing it. So if it's your cup of tea and you make it work, that, that's fine. But like for what I do, I, I don't think it's smart, you know? Yeah. Especially. I'm glad you said that. The style I, that it, the tattoo is done in, I think, makes it a huge difference too, like versus, you know, how everything's going to heal and be so yeah i mean I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat i've always been this way though i mean to me it's like everyone can do whatever they want yeah in this life as yeah. long as what you're doing works for you doesn't hurt people yeah. hurt someone else yeah so you know because there's a you know a lively debate around the subject right now and you know there's some tattooers out there that are vehemently against it they think it's disgusting yeah. and, and all that and missing out on the experience and that might all be true but yeah it's that's their life that's that's that tattooer's life they, yeah they're gonna go do it okay yeah fine. If, it, if it works for you it works for you as long as you have it figured out and it's like actually working and they heal fine and then whatever to each his own it's just not for me <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good way to put it i i, I like that you know don't put your I mean, that, that really kind of stems into the problems of the world, right? Too, yeah. too many people seem to want everyone to live the way that they live. Yeah. And, and that causes like fucking war and shit. Right? Yeah. You can take it all the way to that level, you know? Well, it's like when people, when people come in and they pick their tattooer, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm like, well, if we all, if every single one of us, like if there wasn't like biomech realism, hyper realism, like if every single one of us did the same, then it wouldn't be unique and people wouldn't yeah. want to do it. it it'd be like you know buying car like everything you know yeah. buying cars which cell phones we pick if everybody did everything the same then we'd just be a bunch of robots yeah and life would be pretty boring yeah i mean so. that's the best part about going out there and looking at all those humans everyone's <laughs> doing their own special thing it's yeah. pretty it's pretty cool even though it might not be for me might not be for you 
That's pretty cool. Yeah. What about this whole like AI movement with people using that to create tattoo designs? That I don't like. <laughs> I like barely. Okay, so I I had an iPad before before the stroke, but I didn't barely use it. I I love I love 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 paper. Yeah. I love paper. And now I super don't use it because like the issue is, is like I, I set my hand down on a piece of paper and I have to chase the paper around versus mm -hmm. like tattooing. It, the person is weighted. The iPad is weighted. So then I, I don't chase it around. And that's why I can draw on those two things. But if you ask me to draw on paper, it'll end up looking like I scribbled across the whole thing because I'm chasing the paper around. So you use your iPad now? I do use my iPad now. Okay, I thought severely. you were saying the opposite. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. But yeah. Yes, I, I use it severely now. But there's just... A, a, you miss a, paper. I miss paper. I miss paper so much. You could tape it down. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's not... Like if I if somebody came in for a walk-in, it's not something that I can do quick. Yeah, versus efficient. I can do quick with I love the iPad. I love I I mean to me it's like yeah. it's drawing's drawing. I'm yeah. drawing with this pencil on a mm -hmm. digital tablet. Yeah. Drawing on paper. I mean, I'm drawing. Yeah. You know, and I just find them to be extremely But yeah. I feel like AI like it, it just really takes all the fun out of it. Yeah. It like, does. It does. And it ain't going away. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's something I think about a lot that what made me so special for so many years was I could draw something, you yeah. know, and you had to come to me. And now yeah. people are going on mid journey and they're getting these, some of them pretty radical looking designs. And yeah. They didn't have to draw it at all. Yeah. And they can show the client 17 versions of it and then add it more in the a cubist style. Click a button, boom, it's cubist. Click another button, it's traditional. Yeah. I was messing around with that. I don't use it for my tattoo designs. I still draw all my designs, but I was on mid journey. And uh, cause I had one person I work with who's like, yeah, but it all looks so uh, AI. Yeah. Everything looks like a, a yeah. video game. And I'm like, nah, -uh. I typed in traditional Panther head. Yeah. And they gave me like 10 of them and they were really cool huh. and legit looking like take, I could have taken it right off that program yeah. and tattooed it straight onto someone's body. No yeah. problem. Yeah. So that ain't going away. And and that's fine. I mean. Oh, well, I think that's, it's like the same because like there's all those tattooers that are out there too that that don't draw anything. Yeah. Like where they, they can still execute and pull off a totally clean tattoo with their tracers. Yeah. And they don't actually draw. And I, I feel like it's just. But that's as, about as old school as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, people, some of the old school dudes are like, that's lame. And I'm like, yeah, isn't that where it all started? I yeah. mean, it kind of, yeah. You yes. had a few tattooers in the 1940s that could draw. Yeah. But no, 90, that's where they had flash. Yeah. You were, it was like a barber shop. Yep. You had to be able to technically put ink into skin, but you didn't have to draw. Yeah. You wouldn't even change the design. Yeah. Pick one. A15. All right. You're getting A15. Tasmanian devil. I know, lifting my, barbells. My uncle last night was asking me about tattoos and- he goes, people don't just walk in and, you know, pick stuff off the wall anymore. And I was like, because he was asking me, like, what what it's like now. And I was like, I mean, not it's it's not it's common. I was like, because now there's everything can be customized and every and people draw so much more shit custom. I was like, if you find like a traditional shop, it's it is, you know, still common out there some sometimes. But like at my shop, I would say no one like I, I literally if somebody comes in and is like. I, just, I want that on the wall. I'm like, what? Because yeah. where I live, it's not yeah. like like no one gets stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah now nowadays people bring them. They, yeah. they 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 are at home, and this is going to ramp up fast. Um, there's going to be some apps real soon. I can't. It's probably already there. And you're going to be able to go into that app, uh, take a picture of your chest, and tell it the the parameters to which you want the tattoo design. Click buttons until it gives you the one you think is the coolest. You're going to walk into the tattoo shop and say, that's what I want. Yeah. You know, and, you know, if it's tattooable, most tattooers are going to go sit down, let's do it. Or yeah. the tattooer is going to be like, yeah, I, I just need to simplify a few things and you're going to yeah. get that. Well, I mean, essentially, like, it's kind of already a dumb damn version, like, because Procreate and all those tattoo brush kits. Yeah. You almost can do that. Yeah. I saw a new thing from Procreate where... I think it's like it's like a 3D arm or yeah. leg or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. keeps coming up on ads on my uh, in, on my phone. But yeah, yeah, you have there you, there you have the arm. You can spin it in circles. You can draw yep. on it. You know, yep. Seems kind of functional actually. But they'll probably get to the place where I could take a picture of that person's that actual yeah. you know, short 
hefty, tall, skinny, get mm-hmm. their body in there. Yeah. You know, spin it in circles, draw on it. Yeah. Get it to the place you want to get it, tattoo it. Yeah, it, 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 it's the game is changing big time. And, th- and what that's going to do, it's going to allow more and more people to become tattoo artists. Yeah. Because it used to be a firewall, and the firewall was, do you know how to illustrate? Yeah. Oh, you don't know how to illustrate? Beat it. Gone now, I yeah. think. If it isn't totally gone, it's will be soon enough. Yeah. And yeah, all you folks out there that can't stand what I just said, there's still going to be folks that are wanting analog, old school tattooers yeah. where they draw it on paper, from their mind, to the paper, to the skin. Yeah. That might even become more popular, you know? Yeah. Might, might even be more sought after, more authentic. So I don't think that's going to go away either, but we're going to see a lot more people coming in that don't really have to have those skills anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Just interesting. I, I don't get personally offended by any of it. I'm just observing, you know, like how weird times are changing. Well, it's like, I I feel like I, for me, I feel like the, all uh, these, I don't even know what category to really put these tattooers in, but they're, you know, they learn. Yeah, they do an apprenticeship or whatever, but then they go and they op- open a private studio, and now it's kind of like the whole cancel culture thing, and like, you know, you should expect this from your tattoo artist, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, which you, which some of the things that, that they have to say, I am like super supportive in, but then like the part where they're trying to take like all of like the old school methods and be like, no, it, that's where I'm just like, oh. and also when you, you're not that far into tattooing, I'm just like, you shouldn't put yourself in a box where you're just by yourself. Oh, yeah. You know, I'm still, every single time I, if I get a couple of years into being, you know, out in Arizona and I'm like, I need to be at the bottom of the totem pole. I need, I need, you know, mm. I want other people to teach me. Like, you should always be wanting to learn. How good of a tennis player are you going to be if you went to a tennis court and had a machine chuck balls at you? Yeah. No, I could be that good. Yeah. You got to get another tennis player on the other end of that court who's hopefully better than you yeah that's how you grow yeah it's a trap you know i i don't really care what anyone does be happy yeah Not my problem but if you want my advice a younger tattooer who still hasn't made it to their place in this mm-hmm. world going to a private studio is the great you're gonna, it's gonna slow you down tremendous yeah. i did it i worked for six seven years maybe went private for two years and immediately noticed it. Not the first year. First year I was like, this is fucking awesome. Yeah. I'm my own boss. I, I, it's great. I control my own environment. Year two, I was like, oh, I'm not, my peers are growing faster than I yeah. am. I could see it. Yeah. So I went and that's how I actually opened Guru is I, um, I didn't want to, this is many, many years ago. I didn't want to go back to shops because so many of the shops had so many problems. I was like, yeah. And I had been through so many traumatic events in tattoo shops. I was mm-hmm. like, God, I can't do it. So Opened my own place, brought in tattooers that I respected, and yeah. boom, the the growth was like back on. Yeah, you know exactly, and it should always be that way. I feel. Oh, it depends on a person's goals. I I tell people when I hire them all the time, I go, look, what are your goals? Yeah, I mean, if if you want to have a job mm-hmm. like a barber, where you come in, do some tattoos, go home, barbecue some chicken, yeah, take the weekends off, don't come here, yeah. This is, I built a place where, and there's a lot like this. I'm not trying yeah. to be special. Yeah. But this place is about the, the ones that want to see where they can take it. How far yeah. can you take it? Yeah. And, the, and if that's your goal, you're going to really want to be around a bunch of other really proficient tattooers because yeah. that's what it's going to raise you up. And it's not even from teaching. It's like, uh, it just seeps into you. Yeah. You know, it's not like they're going to show you a needle you didn't understand. Well, if you're around people that want to come to work and, you know, you're coming to, to somewhere like where your mindset's all the same, then like you want to come to work like versus like when, you know, I've been at a shop before and, you know, everybody else was, you know, that that person that you just described and, you know, they just want to, they do one tattoo and then they bail and then they go home and and it it just really like drags you down. And it's just Mm. like, man, like nobody wants to be here. Like nobody wants, you know, to put any more effort. Yeah. and, And I feel like I always need that. So you know, being around people that are like that, that keeps your inspiration up. You know, we, we tend to be able to accomplish things we have seen with our own eyes. Yeah. You could see tattoos on your phone and know they've been done. Yeah. That should work, but it kind of doesn't. But when you walk into a shop and there's a guy right next to you doing something amazing Mm -hmm. in your mind, you're like, well, I know him. He he has problems. He has challenges. Yet he did that tattoo today. Yeah. I can do it too. And as soon as you make that decision yeah. in your mind, 
you rise to that level. It's yeah. just how life works, you know? Yeah, I agree. All the uh, pri- And then there's the guy who's made it and he's the man and mm-hmm. he's in his private studio or she's in her private studio. Yeah, I get that. You know, you've, you've, yeah. you've done it. You've developed your style. You develop, you're where you're at. Probably can go somewhere in a cave and just yeah. keep on trucking, you know, to yeah. some degree and then go out and do conventions and expose yourself occasionally. It'll, yeah, you see that, I, I, yeah, the private studio thing, I've, I, it does seem to be not a, it's it's kind of reached its apex. And yeah. Now I see, I've seen several private studio owners that are now coming back to the shops. Yeah. For that reason. Plus, there is a something going on in the world of marketing that's new, which is, God, these words, I hate even uttering <laughs> these words because, man, for years I love, my friends were in different industries and I would brag to them. Yeah. Oh, I love my industry. Why? Because it's so honest. What do you mean? Well, if you're good at it, then you do it and someone tells a friend and they come and get it. Yeah. It's great. I don't have to go to marketing meetings. I don't have to worry about any of that shit you guys are doing. Yeah. I don't think that's the case anymore. If you don't show up in the algorithm, then no one knows you exist. And that private studio thing gets harder and harder. You know, so marketing budgets are necessary you know, to thrive, yeah. to survive is, we're not talking about survival. We're talking about thriving. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've talked to a few people that went solo and they're like, bro, I just, I can't really keep busy in my studio. And they go with a bigger shop that's got marketing budgets and to get them noticed to get, yeah. you know, where the action is. So yeah, these are just all things that are occurring in talk- tattooing, you know. I was talking about that last night with my uncle and uh, I was talking about, I was like, it's not, so I, I still have one, but portfolios it was like people don't come in to look at portfolios anymore which is actually another really funny story i went into your shop when i was i must have been 17 it was way before i started tattooing in pb it was before i even thought about tattooing but i i had went into your shop but and that was when everybody had portfolios and you had to look at the tattoo Mm -hmm. artist's portfolio and be like well i like i like this style or or this style or you know you and you had to come in and you had to meet the person like and talk about the tattoo and and get an idea of like how it was going to work and everything like that. And that's just completely gone. But I feel like it's completely gone because of like marketing and because of Instagram and it, everything is just through, you know, let me just send it, you know, an email. And I'm, I personally, I'm not that tattoo artist. I hate emails. I don't like receiving, like, I, it's just not for me. Like I want somebody to come in. I want them to talk to me. I want there to be like, interaction a relationship yeah yeah that's another aspect of tattooing that people are missing out on because one thing about getting a tattoo it embeds in you an experience yeah and you can deepen and enrich that experience by having a connection to the human being that's tattooing you and that begins with Mm -hmm. sitting down and First, deciding if you like the person. Yeah. Oh, wow, I yeah, like or, you. Or if you want to spend hours with him inflicting pain on you. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, and that it has become less and less. And that's fine. But, you know, I like that part. Yeah. I like to know who's tattooing me. I feel yeah. like the person. I've got tattoos on me that they don't bug me anymore. Yeah. But the people that did them yeah. aren't, aren't great people, in yeah. my opinion. And every time I look at that tattoo, it's like a little sadness creeps in. Yeah, it you know. It, you think about that person because that person did it. it I, I I have people that come to me and I'm not amazing by any means. I could do a decent tattoo, but I'm not amazing. And I, I have people that will come to me and they're just like, I don't care because I am comfortable with you. I like you, like the stories, mm-hmm. the, the, the environment, everything. They're like, everything about it is good. And I don't want to go to a different person mm-hmm. because of that. And, th- th- you know, because I, I have a kind of new newer tattoo we're tattooing with us. And, you know, me and one of the other tattooers were sitting there talking with them. And I was like, there are so many different aspects. There's, you know, you could have clientele based off of like your personality, mm-hmm. you know, your actual tattooing. Like there's a lot of different things. Like there, there were times when in the beginning of my tattooing where I was only a couple years into it, but I went in and because I am a woman, it was just assumed that you're not a tattooer. You know, and and then they were talking to me like I was ignorant and I had no idea what I was talking about. And I'm like, OK, I'm not getting tattooed here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big part of it. I like I like that you're um, you recognize that. Yeah. You seem to be rooted in some of the traditions yes. of, of our beautiful art form. 
Kudos to you for that. That's cool. Thanks. It's nice to see it's still alive. Yeah. You're, you're, I call it, well, you're like 16 years. You're yeah. still a youngster for a yes, guy like I, me. Yes, I, I am a baby. Well, that's what I was going to say. I was like, I am still a baby. But like I was telling my family, I was like, what's crazy is like Guru was one of the first shops that I went into like as a kid. And I was like, he's been around for a long time. Yeah. 32 years, I think now. <laughs> Went by quick. Wish I would have slowed down and smelled the roses a little more, but <laughs> such is life. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming out. Thank you for who you are, for Thanks. being an Thanks inspiration me. to me. You know, I have my little bitches and wines that I yeah. get up with every day. I I'm going to bitch and wine a little less <laughs> after being with you. I can, I've absorbed some of that. It's cool. You were able to overcome that. Your love, your passion for tattooing, your passion for life got you back on that horse mm -hmm. and you're riding again. And I think that's awesome. So Thanks. thank you for that. I'm here for it. Sweet. Well, before we close out, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Solon Clothing for all of you out there that love tattoo art and you love clothing. I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming most of you wear clothing. Um, and if you'd like to see some of that art on clothing, please check out SolonClothing.com. Some of the best tattoo artists in the world put their art right on their stuff. High quality stuff, best, most comfortable stuff I've ever worn. Ryan and Jeremy, huge supporters of the tattoo industry, huge supporter of this show. So check out solidclothing.com. And that'll probably end it for today. Stay tuned for our next episode. And please keep the likes coming. The subs I, you guys hate, I know you right now you're turning this show off, but maybe some of you haven't turned me off yet. I need your help, guys, I, girls and guys. I, I can't uh, keep doing this forever without your love, without your support. Like, share, subscribe. It means the world to me. It's what keeps this thing running. So for those of you that have done it, thank you. For those of you who haven't, please, I'm begging you to do so. And uh, that'll pretty much wrap it up for today. I think we're going to leave on the note of gratitude and yeah. perseverance. Right? Mm -hmm. Sound good? Yep. All right. High five. Boom. <laughs> All right. That's it for now. See you on the next one. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs>